the Apocrypha. The Bible is an extraordinarily different book depending on which church you belong to. If you're a Protestant or a Catholic, your church recognizes 27 books in the New Testament. However, if you belong to the Protestant religion, you also recognize 39 books from the Old Testament. On the other hand, Roman Catholics keep 46 books from the Old Testament as canon, seven more than the Protestants. Then there's the Orthodox Church, which has three extra books, including those in the Old Testament and the New Testament, bringing their total biblical canon to 73 books. But by far the most inclusive church in the world is the Ethiopian Church, who accepts all 81 books of the Bible more than any other religion. But what's the big difference between all these books? The answer is something called the Apocrypha. These are the forbidden books that the Roman Catholic Church cut from their mainstream Bible after the Dark Ages. The Apocrypha are considered dubious or questionable at best. They're made up of a body of esoteric writings and historical accounts of biblical figures and events. Many of the Old Testament books talk about the life and times of characters who appear in the standard Bible, but they don't include a lot of backstory. You can almost think of the Apocrypha as spin-offs. They go into greater detail on the life of Adam and Eve, the events prior to the Great Flood, and even things like Jesus' childhood, Slave Bible. An extremely controversial Bible from the 19th century was recently on display at the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. Fisk University in Nashville says there's only three copies of the Bible in existence. These same researchers also say the Bible was a tool for propaganda and it was used to distribute fake news to the masses, basically brainwashing an entire population of people. It was utilized by British missionaries to convert early American slaves to Christianity. This particular Bible was published in 1807. Anthony Schmidt, the curator of Bible and religion in America at the Washington Museum, says this book was printed specifically for African slaves in the British West Indies, or what we now refer to as the Caribbean. The Bible was edited in such a gruesome manner that every story of rebellion was omitted. The editors completely altered the structure of the Christian Bible. They removed around 90% of the Old Testament, which was a lot of stories about the Israelites escaping their bonds of slavery and leaving Egypt. They also removed about 50% of the New Testament. The Bible was cut from 1,189 chapters to only 232 in order to meet their agenda. Every chapter was specifically added to prevent any thought of escaping slavery while still promoting the transition to Christianity. The Book of Enoch Out of all the Apocrypha, the Book of Enoch is by far the most controversial. This ancient religious text was supposedly written by the great-grandfather of Noah himself. Enoch discusses the gift of knowledge that was given to the humans by the Watchers, a group of angels who came down from heaven and blessed humanity with secret skills, and mystical teachings. This book sets up a reason for God to initiate the Great Flood, which destroys almost all life on the planet. However, a lot of people believe the Book of Enoch doesn't have anything to do with religion and is instead nothing but smoke, mirrors, and metaphors. Enoch describes the Watchers in great detail. According to him, they were angelic beings who came down from the heavens with their advanced knowledge. They then bred with human women, which resulted in the creation of a race of giants called the Nephilim. Some religious scholars have suggested the Watchers were not angels, but in fact extraterrestrial beings. These aliens, sometimes referred to as the Anunnaki, came down at the dawn of civilization, prior to humanity gaining the wisdom needed for advanced cultures. The Watchers gave the primitive people of Earth that very knowledge and exposed them to sophisticated technology. Nobody knows what the Book of Enoch truly means. It was written over 2,000 years ago by an unknown author. Whatever the case may be, the Catholic Church deemed the concepts too uncomfortable to add to the Bible. And so, the Book of Enoch became forbidden. The English Reformation The 16th century was a turbulent time for Catholicism in England. The Protestant Reformation was already underway. The Vatican forbade anyone from translating the Bible into English, and people were beginning to have their doubts. The Church was purposely withholding an English Bible from the masses 
so the common people couldn't read it themselves. But in 1535, English scholar William Tyndale finally translated the Bible, something that would earn him a brutal strangulation in 1536. Shortly after this, King Henry VIII decided he would move his country away from the Roman Catholic Church. This resulted in the English Reformation, a division in the church that was made possible because the king wanted to legally divorce his wife and take on a younger mistress. Keep in mind, these are the kinds of things the church does not want you to know about. There are entire branches of faith in existence because of kings who wanted to change the rules to better suit their own whims and desires. In 1539, King Henry VIII had declared himself the supreme leader of the Church of England, and he was in the midst of dissolving English monasteries. He also authorized the publication of the first legal English Bible, and that was how England cut ties with Rome and started their own church, branching even further from the original teachings of Jesus, the flaying of Saint Bartholomew. Bartholomew the Apostle was one of the followers of Jesus Christ during the Messiah's years of teaching. After Jesus died, Bartholomew split up from the rest of the Apostles, many of whom went their own way, and he helped to spread the word of the Lord across the globe. It's been said that Bartholomew traveled east and found his way to Armenia, where he converted the king to Christianity. For doing this, Bartholomew received one of the worst deaths of any of the Apostles. He was flayed alive meaning his skin was peeled off like you might peel the skin off a carrot. This might not be completely accurate, but it's the most popular theory. He was captured in the city of Albanopolis, and he was either flayed alive before being beheaded, or he was crucified upside down just like Saint Peter. This was all because he converted Polymius, king of Armenia, to the new religion of Christianity. The king's brother was so furious that he ordered Bartholomew to be tortured and executed. That's one story, but there are many. One of the biggest issues with the saints of Christianity is that they're little more than legends. What the church doesn't want people knowing is just how fictitious many of their characters are. Even if Bartholomew was real, there's no historical records of an Armenian king named Polymius. This part of the story is completely made up. Even though there's monasteries in Armenia dedicated to St. Bartholomew and his martyrdom, there's no physical evidence that he existed or that he was flayed in Armenia. Many scholars believe a more reasonable explanation is that Bartholomew, assuming he did live, died in Kalyan, India. Do you think St. Bartholomew was a real person that was flayed alive, or do you think he was a fictional character that was added to the Bible. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and while you're at it, hit that subscribe button. The Gothic Bible, Codex Argentius. The Goths who sacked Rome and ravaged Europe, later settled in parts of Germany, France, and Spain, and surprisingly, they had their very own Bible. It was written in the Gothic language, which is currently extinct and known only by the most skilled scholars. In the 4th century AD, during the fall of Rome, the Codex Argentius was created by Bishop Ulfilax in what is now northern Bulgaria. It was the original four Gospels translated into the Gothic language so that the destroyers of the Roman Empire could have their own Bible to read. This Bible was created at a time when the Ostrogoths ruled Italy, but their reign didn't last long. The Goths were assimilated by the Lombards in 553 AD, and many of their manuscripts in Italy were considered to be garbage. They were thrown into the trash, and the Codex Argentius wasn't discovered until the 16th century. It was a thousand years after the Goths were gone that their last remaining Bible was uncovered at a monastery in Germany called the Verden Abbey. This is now one of the most historically important Bibles on the planet. It doesn't contain any secret or forbidden knowledge, but it's a crucial piece of text from the fall of Rome. Even as the mighty empire collapsed, there was no destroying the spread of Christianity. The Books of Esdras There were initially four books of Esdras in the Bible. There's one Ezra, Nehemiah, first Esdras, and second Esdras. The last three were scrapped from the original Bible because the church believed the knowledge in these sections were too advanced and controversial far more difficult for ordinary people to understand. The authorship of all four books is attributed to Ezra. He was a scribe and priest who lived in the 5th century BC. This means he was alive during the fall of Jerusalem, and so he shares his experiences during the chaos in these books. 
While his people are suffering and his city is being torn apart, God speaks with him and because of his righteousness, grants Ezra a glimpse into the truth of history. This is why 1st Esdras and 2nd Esdras are considered so forbidden. They describe how Ezra was given a glimpse into the mysteries of life on the planet, as well as the future of God's creation. He was also allowed to see how the world would eventually come to an end. Ezra sees seven visions of the apocalypse, much like Daniel in the book of Revelation. However, Ezra's story is a lot less exciting, but it does end very similarly to the book of Revelation. The Messiah triumphs over the evil empire, breathing fire on all those who oppose him. The world is then restored to peace and order. It's a calmer apocalypse without all the plagues and locusts that made it into the complete Bible. Thomas Cromwell's Deception the first official English Bible printed by King Henry during the English Reformation was called the Great Bible. It was the job of Henry's chief minister Thomas Cromwell to print and distribute the book to just about every parish church in the realm. However, Cromwell was secretly plotting to use his position as publisher to change the balance of power. Cromwell was the most powerful man underneath King Henry but he wanted to have even more influence, so he used the mass printing of the Great Bible to accomplish that. On the title page of the Great Bible is an image of King Henry handing copies of the Bible to Cromwell, and then Cromwell can be seen handing them to clergymen and other nobility. This was a way for Henry to be seen as the true leader of the church, the distributor of the Holy Word itself. But before King Henry handed it to the masses, he first gave it to Cromwell, which solidified his position as the king's right-hand man. The shocking part is that Cromwell is not the man we see on the title page of the Great Bible. The man resembles him, but only because he copied and pasted his face onto somebody else. Cromwell used his position to expertly cover the face of whoever was supposed to be next to King Henry with his own. He did this by employing an artist who painstakingly edited each and every Bible that came from the presses in France. Unfortunately for Cromwell, he died a year later when he was executed for high treason, making his attempt to seize power a complete and utter failure. The Wisdom of Solomon One of the mysterious apocryphal books you don't hear much about is The Wisdom of Solomon. This book was written in Alexandria a couple of decades before the birth of Christ. It was allegedly composed by a Jewish person living in the city who wrote the chapters in Greek. The book consists of three main parts, none of which seem to have any connection to one another. The first part of the book talks about the rulers of the earth and how wisdom is such a necessity to them. It goes into detail on the immoral and ungodly Epicureans as well as other heathens like them who practice lawlessness, lust, and incest. It talks about how righteous men become the sons of God and how they earn immortality through their good deeds. It's all extremely vague and metaphorical, which is likely why it was pushed out of the main Bible by the Catholic Church. The second section of the book talks about King Solomon. He's described as having mystical powers, with his wisdom being so strong that he's granted the ability of prophecy and the capacity to see through the mysteries of the world. In this chapter, wisdom is a cosmic force, something needed to teach the cardinal virtues of temperance, justice, prudence, and fortitude. The book even states that wisdom is a cosmic principle which sits upon a throne of glory next to God himself essentially placing wisdom as godliness. In this book, one can get the feeling that wisdom is itself God, and that Solomon's intelligence is what makes him such a great king. The third and final part of the book has pretty much nothing to do with the other two sections. It's not much more than a history of the Israelites escaping Egypt. The Prayer of Azariah the Prayer of Azariah is another forbidden book of the Bible which was originally included in the Latin Bible as well as the Roman Catholic Biblical Canon. The book goes into great detail on the story of three young Jewish men who found themselves on the wrong side of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were tied up and thrown into a furnace when they refused to worship a false idol, infuriating the king of Babylon. But as they walked into the furnace and sang praises to God, their prayers were heard and they were saved from the flames. This forbidden book isn't prohibited for any reasons of tainted knowledge or secret wisdom, but for some reason biblical scholars simply don't like it. The book is more of a hymn with an accompanying song written in the first century BC. 
It's often seen as boring and unimportant, which is why only parts of it were chosen and inserted into Catholic and Orthodox church services. This picking and choosing has been going on for over 2,000 years, and the prayer of Azariah is a perfect example of how the church controls what its followers are exposed to, based on little more than its own whims. Pope Urban II Pope Urban II is most famous for ordering the very first crusade and plunging the Middle Ages into years of conflict and bloodshed. On November 27, 1095, the Pope made what is believed to be the most influential speech of the medieval age. He incited violence by calling all Christians in Europe to fight against the Muslims and reclaim the Holy Land. It was Pope Urban II who cried, God wills it. In other words, he claimed God wanted Europe to fight against the Muslims and retake Jerusalem at any cost. The Holy Land encompasses the entirety of the Middle East. It's the birthplace of Christianity and Judaism centered in the city of Jerusalem. Since the 6th century, the Holy Land had been firmly controlled by Muslims. Then, in the 11th century, the Seljuk Turks abruptly decided Christians would no longer be allowed inside Jerusalem. Christians were banished, and the Turks also made threats against the Byzantine Empire, saying they would take the city of Constantinople. Emperor Alexius I appealed to Pope Urban II for help, and thus began the Crusades. The Pope used his power to unite Europe under a Christian banner. About 100,000 soldiers took up the call, and this was only the first of seven major military campaigns that would take place over the next 200 years. Pope Julius III Pope Julius III came into power after the death of Paul III. He ruled the Papal States from February of 1550 up until his death five years later in 1555. As you've learned by now, popes had extremely short lifespans, just like Roman emperors. As Pope, Julius III did almost nothing he was supposed to do. Instead, he dedicated himself to a life of personal pleasure and self-fulfillment. His papacy was filled with scandal, but the worst involved his adopted nephew. Innocenzo Chocchi del Monte was a beggar discovered on the street of Parma. He was hired by the Pope's family to be a lowly hall boy or a domestic worker. The boy was around 14 years old, and he was immediately given the title Cardinal Nephew when Julius became the Pope. However, it's likely he wasn't promoted based on his merits. Rumors began to circle that the Pope was having an extremely inappropriate relationship with the young boy. He was treated like the Pope's pet, and this reflected very poorly on the Church. We still don't know what the exact nature of their relationship was, but it was bad enough that after Pope Julius died, the boy was banished. Pope Nicholas V when Portugal expanded into Western Africa in the 15th century, merchants began to understand the economic advantage of a massive slave trafficking enterprise. It all began in 1441 with ship captain Antam Gonçalves. He traveled to West Africa and there he acquired a load of sealskin and oil, but he wasn't satisfied with his profit margins. Before he sailed away, he led a raiding party into Cap Blanc and kidnapped a pair of local indigenous people. He brought these captives back to Portugal to show the royal family just how profitable a slave trade could be. This is generally seen as the beginning of a very dark time in human history. But this was far from the first time there had been mass slavery. The Romans were some of the worst offenders, and for this reason there were strict laws in place. In the 15th century, there were clear guidelines in the way that people of specific religions were to be treated but their laws really only applied to Christians, Jews, and Muslims. As for the people of Africa, they were seen as barbarians. This is where Pope Nicholas V comes into play. Between 1452 and 1455, Pope Nicholas released a series of official decrees, giving Portugal the holy right to enslave African human beings. Church leaders argued that slavery was a great way to Christianize the people of Africa, and the Pope agreed 100%. Pope Nicholas V was largely responsible for the normalization of slavery in Europe, essentially blessing the whole operation by saying it was what God wanted. 
Pope Boniface VIII. Pope Boniface VIII is known by some as the Devil Pope for his supposed worship of Satan. He was elected to become Pope in 1294 because he was known to be a very religious man and had a reputation for integrity. When Pope Boniface was elected, he was living as a hermit in a mountain cave. The College of Cardinals had to travel thousands of feet up the mountains just to tell him he was going to be Pope. The details surrounding his election are so dramatic they could be made into a mini-series. The previous Pope, Celestine V, was wildly unpopular but still had a lot of powerful friends in powerful places. He renounced the papacy because the people hated him so much, but he still had influence. Pope Boniface knew this, so he imprisoned him as his first act and kept him locked in a castle until he died. Pope Boniface VIII seemed to do well in the beginning. He formalized the Jubilees and founded the University of Rome La Sapienza, but then his hunger for power grew. He wound up becoming a great enemy of King Philip IV of France and exiled him from the church in 1303. King Philip was notoriously cruel and allegedly spread rumors that Pope Boniface was a devil worshipper. After the Pope died shortly after exiling Philip under mysterious circumstances, the King staged a trial in which the dead Pope was charged with heresy. Pope Alexander VI Pope Alexander VI was the most corrupt and sinful priest that ever sat on the Vatican's great seat of power. He is by far history's dirtiest Pope, and you'll be shocked to find out why. Pope Alexander VI was born Rodrigo Borgia in 1431. The Borgia family was one of the wealthiest and noblest households in all of Spain. They had massive amounts of money and power, and their influence was prominent across much of Europe. It was Rodrigo's uncle, Alfonso de Borgia, who became Pope Calixtus III in 1455. The papacy during the Middle Ages was a lot more concerned with power and influence than about closeness to God, although some might say that has never changed. Like many popes, Calixtus III appointed his own relatives and friends to the best positions in the church. This was what ultimately led Rodrigo to being sworn in as the Pope in 1492. However, he also had to bribe quite a few cardinals to beat his other family members to the papacy. Once he was named Pope, Alexander's reign of terror began. One of his first sins was the practice of simony, meaning he sold church offices to the highest bidders. Whoever had the most money could have the best position in the church. He also had expensive parties, the likes of which the Vatican had never seen before. One of the most famous of these celebrations occurred on October 30th, 1501. The Pope brought an estimated 50 prostitutes into the Vatican and had an all-night party with his own young son in attendance. These kinds of misdeeds continued throughout his entire time as Pope. Alexander VI died in 1503 from a mysterious disease. His body bloated, he became discolored, and then he passed away. Some historians believe he was bitten by a mosquito and caught malaria, while others think he was assassinated for being such a sinful pope. He was succeeded by Julius II, who refused to even live in the same rooms as Alexander because he was known for being so disgusting. Do you think the papacy is still as corrupt today as it was hundreds of years ago? Let us know what you think in the comments, and while you're at it, hit that subscribe button. Pope Damasus I Pope Damasus I was one of the first popes in history, ruling the church in the Western Roman Empire, likely from between 304 to 384 AD. However, historians aren't completely sure on all the dates. They also don't know if the Pope was born in Spain or Portugal, but they seem to agree that he was most likely raised in the Roman Empire. Damasus served as Pope during some of the first years that Christianity was gaining power. At this time, pagans were still running wild, and the Roman Empire had yet to collapse in on itself. In fact, it was during Damasus's rule that Christianity became the official religion of Rome. Throughout his papacy, Damasus was accused of murder and adultery. Many people who lived during his rule also believed him to be immoral. He was said to participate in lavish parties, he was friends with powerful leaders of other major religions, and he personally knew all of the most important pagan cult high priests. Damasus was called the Lady's Ear Tickler by his critics, which is unsettling to say the least. And in the year 378 AD, he was accused of cheating on his wife, but the claim was put to rest by Emperor Gratian. Shortly after he was found innocent of adultery, everyone who accused him of the sin was cast out of the church and banished. Pope Innocent III 
Pope Innocent III will forever be remembered as the man who started the Albigensian Crusade. In the 13th century, there was a movement spreading across Europe that not too many people know about. It was called Catharism, and it was a kind of dualist religion that challenged the teachings of the Catholic Church. The movement began to blossom, with the followers of Catharism referring to themselves as good Christians. They were trying to take all the best parts of Christianity and dismiss the corruption, violence, and brutality that was the Catholic Church. This was not ideal for Pope Innocent III, who liked the Church just the way it was, so he began a crusade against them. On July 22, 1209, the Pope's army committed a massacre at the city of Béziers. The army killed about 20,000 people with their swords, making it one of the greatest one-sided slaughters in history. Commanders in the army were ordered to kill everyone, and they were told that God would sort out the Christians. The soldiers knew they were murdering people of their own faith, but they chose not to care, and it was all orchestrated by the Pope who considered what happened a divine vengeance. On the day of the crusade, 7,000 people alone were trapped in the church of St. Mary Magdalene, and they were shown no mercy. Men, women, and children all were slain. By the time the crusaders were done, nobody in the town was left alive. Pope John XII. Pope John XII became the ruler of the Papal States on December 16, 955 AD. He held the position until his untimely death in 964 AD. His name was Octavian before becoming Pope John, and he had direct ties to a powerful Roman family that controlled the politics and the church for at least half a century. Unfortunately for him, he became a pope a little too early. Pope John XII was only a teenager when he took the greatest seat of power available in Rome. One of his first moves as pope was to attack the Lombard people of Italy, who had taken several chunks of the Papal States. He wanted to reclaim land, but it didn't work out in his favor. As a teenager, John found that he was not able to control the Roman nobility, something his predecessor had done so easily. Fearing for his life, Pope John XII reached out to King Otto I of Germany. Together, they made a pact. King Otto would defend the Pope with everything he had, and in return, the Pope would make Otto the Holy Roman Emperor. After being crowned, Otto became the most powerful man in Italy. Pope John soon realized he'd made a mistake. Emperor Otto was far more powerful than the young Pope could ever hope to be. John was also a notorious scumbag, and it was apparent to the people that he cared very little about the church. He was seen as vain, and he was always sleeping with people's wives. There was going to be a conflict between the emperor and the pope, but then John died abruptly on May 14, 964 AD. According to the legends, he was caught in bed with a man's wife and was strangled to death. Pope Clement VII Pope Clement VII began his life as a member of the Medici family, and was originally named Giulio de Giuliano de Medici. His family was once one of the most politically influential households in all of Italy. They were extremely wealthy, and they were so important that their children were welcome to become Pope, even if they had no legitimate qualifications. To make things worse, Pope Clement was an illegitimate child, and he was raised by his uncle, Lorenzo the Magnificent. He went on to become the Pope in 1523, and ruled the Vatican for 11 years. Clement wasn't necessarily an evil Pope, he just made a lot of really poor decisions. He didn't understand the Lutheran movement that was happening, nor did he know how to make proper alliances. Emperor Charles V had endorsed his candidacy for Pope, and yet Clement allied himself with the Emperor's enemy, Francis I of France. He basically spat in the face of the Emperor, which later resulted in his imprisonment inside the castle of Sant'Angelo. The Pope's misguided attempt to be friends with France resulted in Rome being pillaged by the Emperor. Then, when the Emperor refused to pay the mercenaries, they ravaged Rome in May of 1527. The only thing Clement VII did during his rule that didn't end in a bunch of people getting killed was when he commissioned Michelangelo to paint the Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel. Pope Liberius Pope Liberius I became the Pope on May 17, 352 AD. Unfortunately for him, he was immediately thrown into a controversy and soon wound up in jail. When he became Pope, there was an ongoing conflict between a priest in Alexandria named Arius, who had come up with a variation of the doctrine of the Trinity. 
This priest claimed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and therefore separate from God himself. This was against the idea the Catholic Church had always pushed, that the Trinity, meaning Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, are all one with no separation. The Church's stance was solid, but the same couldn't be said for Emperor Constantius II, who was a follower of Arius. When Pope Liberius refused to change the official stance of the church, the emperor had him kidnapped and imprisoned for two years. He was exiled to the land of Thrace in northern Greece, and while he was imprisoned, the emperor allegedly forged letters in his handwriting and cast out the pesky Egyptian bishop from the church. However, there is some speculation regarding the true events that took place during this time. This was almost 2,000 years ago, and so it's difficult to say who was right and who was wrong. Supposedly, Liberius was never officially made a saint, which is extremely odd. Many people believe this is because Liberius was guilty of heresy and that he wrote the letters to cast out the Egyptian bishop, not Emperor Constantius. It was all part of his plan to save his job and return to being pope instead of a prisoner. Who do you think was the worst pope of all time? The 1492 Expulsion the leaders of the church were behind the horrific massacre of 1391, and they were also behind another terrible event that took place in Spain in 1492, the same year Christopher Columbus made his journey to the New World. But what they don't teach you in school is that just days before Columbus set sail, religious fanaticism endorsed by the church resulted in one of the greatest religious evacuations in history. The Alhambra Decree was issued on March 31, 1492. It was officiated by Catholic monarchs in Spain, and it ordered the expulsion of any practicing Jewish person from Castile and Aragon. Every Jew was forced to either leave Spain or convert to Catholicism by July 31st, only five days before Columbus set sail. Following the horrific events of 1391, around half of Spain's Jewish population had already converted to Catholicism. By 1415, an estimated 50 thousand more converted because of the continuous attacks they endured. With the Alhambra Decree, roughly 200,000 Jews converted to Catholicism in order to remain in Spain, and 100,000 more were kicked out of the country. The expulsion was a huge event that led to a chain reaction of migration, with Jews flooding Italy, Greece, Turkey, and other places in Europe. The church was fully behind the expulsion, but it took the monarchs of Spain about 10 years to get the Vatican behind their decision. The monarchs were afraid of the potential influence Jews may have had on the population. They wanted to ensure that their institutions were not overrun with Judaism and that they could remain in power. It wasn't until 1968 that the Vatican finally revoked the decree. The Massacre of 1391 the Spanish Inquisition was one of the most horrendous things ever executed by the Church. However, it all started many decades earlier with the Massacre of 1391. This was a savage display of anti-Semitic violence in Spain, and the peak of one of the worst outbreaks of anti-Semitism in Europe during the Middle Ages. In the 14th century, Jewish people living in the Iberian Peninsula were not universally liked. In fact, they were downright hated. This was mainly because the Catholic Church pushed a narrative that the Jewish people were responsible for the crucifixion of Christ. Even though the Church teaches that Jesus Christ died specifically for the sins of humanity, meaning he was always meant to die, they still blamed the Jews. This led to anti-Semitism and violence. Between 1350 and 1365, Pedro I, also known as Peter the Cruel, was the King of Castile in Spain. He was a protector of the Jews and fought for their rights, especially after three separate massacres in 1355, 1360, and 1366. But in 13 1969, he was murdered by his half-brother, and suddenly the royal protection was gone. Then came the Archdeacon of Esca, Ferrand Martinez. He incited hate against the Jewish people on behalf of the church. He criticized them harshly and demanded that authorities begin removing them from the population. This ended in the tragedy of 1391. About 4,000 Jews in Seville had their houses attacked and destroyed, and the rest were bullied into converting to Christianity. The violence began in Seville, but spread across the kingdom, which resulted in an estimated 50,000 deaths over just three months. The Power of the Witch Starting in the 16th century, witch hunts became a serious problem in Europe. 
The Great Hunt, as historians call it, was a phenomenon that lasted between 1560 and 1630. For about 70 years, witch hunters accused about 80,000 people of witchcraft, which led to roughly 40,000 deaths. But why did this happen, and how did it start? According to expert economist Peter Leeson, it was just business. Peter believes that witchcraft paranoia started because of the division in the church. Both the Protestant and Catholic churches persecuted witches, and they used their high numbers of successful executions to lure in potential followers. More simply, each church practiced the persecution of witches to make them look more effective at protecting people from Satan. Witchcraft wasn't seen as an issue prior to the 15th century. From between 900 AD and 1400, the church didn't acknowledge the existence of witches at all. Because the church didn't believe in hocus-pocus and magic, they didn't kill people for witchcraft. Such a thing was prohibited in 1258 by Pope Alexander IV. It wasn't until the Protestant Reformation that the prohibition of persecuting witches was turned around. The church suddenly admitted witches were real, and it was all because they were losing members. The witch hunts were all part of a plan to convince people that the Catholic Church was the right place to be. The Horror of the Inquisition The Spanish Inquisition began in 1478 and would continue for almost 400 years. The purpose of this institution was to combat the spread of heresy in Spain. However, what really happened was that Spain used the church to consolidate power within the newly unified Spanish kingdoms of Castile and Aragon. The Spanish Inquisition established by the Roman Catholic Church resulted in widespread death, chaos, and unimaginable suffering. When it began, Spain was unique in the European world. The country was multicultural, with a large population of Muslims and Jews. This is because the Moorish people had occupied Spain and Portugal starting in the 8th century, but they lost all their power in the 14th century. With the Catholics on top once again, the monarchy was desperate to remove any potential threats, including those of other religions. The first people to participate in the Spanish Inquisition were so brutal that Pope Sixtus IV tried to cancel the whole institution. But it was too late, and the wheels were already moving. In 1483, the Pope authorized the government of Spain to name someone as the Grand Inquisitor. Tomás de Torquemada was subsequently given this title, and his name soon became synonymous with torture and pain. In his short tenure as Grand Inquisitor, Tomás de Torquemada had an estimated 2,000 people burned at the stake. He also had a hand in the Alhambra Decree and the expulsion of Jews in 1492. Burning Joan of Arc The burning of Joan of Arc was a truly dark point in the history of the church. Joan was born in France to a farmer in 1412. Three years after her birth, the One Hundred Years' War entered one of its most important phases. England's King Henry V invaded France, and he won multiple battles. This left the French in serious trouble. By 1422, the English controlled most of northern France, which included Paris. It was around that time when a young girl named Joan began to hear voices in her head. She was only 16 years old when she claimed that Saint Michael, Saint Catherine, and Saint Mark Margaret were whispering inside her brain. The saints supposedly told Joan that she needed to help capture the city of Reims and help protect the French throne. She set out on her mission to save France in May of 1428. Through sheer determination, the teenage farm girl soon became a warrior and leader of men. She led the charge into multiple battles after convincing generals and even soon-to-be King Charles that she was sent by God to be the savior of the country. She inspired the French people and took the city of Orléans on May 8, 1428. Over the next five weeks, she continued to pull in victories over the English until Charles VII was crowned King of France. Sadly, in 1430, she was captured by the English and was arrested. She was put on trial and eventually sentenced to death for refusing to submit to the church. This led to her being burned at the stake as a heretic on May 30th, 1431, at only 19 years old. Do you think Joan of Arc really heard voices that urged her to protect the French throne? Or do you think she just wanted to get in on the action and use that as a way for people to trust her? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and while you're at it, hit that subscribe button. The Crusades One of the defining events of the Middle Ages was the initiation of the Crusades in the 11th century. This religious war went on for roughly 200 years, and is considered an extremely evil time in the church's history. 
The Crusades began in November of 1095. Pope Urban II in France asked all of the Western Christians to take up arms against the Muslims in the Eastern Roman Empire so that they could recapture the Holy Land. The First Crusade was from between 1096 to 1099, resulting in the fall of Jerusalem. The First Crusade was a major success for the Catholic Church. The leaders of the Church promised that every crusader who fought for the Kingdom of God would get into heaven for free. Those who died in battle would be granted access to paradise, just like Viking warriors being accepted into Valhalla. As a result, the entire continent full of bloodthirsty men thought they could get away with heinous war crimes because they were doing it for the Catholic Church. With every crusade, it got less about toppling Muslim forces in the Holy Land and more about silencing enemies of the Catholic Church. The final crusades were fought between 1208 and 1271, and were aimed specifically at rooting out heretics at home in Europe. The Albigensian Crusade was fought in France, and the Baltic Crusades between 1211 and 1225 took place in Transylvania against pagans. People kept showing up to these battles because they were promised free tickets to heaven. Soldiers were allowed to kill and pillage without fear of punishment, basically carrying out the church's dirty bidding. The Malleus Maleficarum the Malleus Maleficarum was a manual on witch hunting that was written in Latin and was presented to the University of Cologne in 1487. The title translates into English as the Hammer of Witches. It was written by James Sprenger and Henry Kramer as a detection manual for those practicing witchcraft. Back then, if you suspected someone was in cahoots with the devil, you would look to this book as a guide. It was used for the next 300 years and had a major impact on witch trials throughout Europe. People seemed to believe it back then, but this book was really just a work of fiction. And yet it became as important to Europeans as a law book. Ways for potential witches to be tortured and killed were detailed, and specific evidence for witchcraft was outlined in the Malleus Maleficarum. Most frightening of all was that the book revealed exactly how to identify a witch, and it was not ideal for a lot of people. It said a woman was a witch if she had a strange birthmark, if she lived alone, if she acted peculiar, or if she cultivated medicine. The potential for a woman being a witch was so broad that many people used the book just to kill their wives or to get rid of their annoying neighbors. The Demonic Pope Pope Boniface VIII is considered by many historians to be the least saintly pope in history. He was the head of the Catholic Church from December 1294 until his death in 1303. After the unexpected abdication of Pope Celestine V, Boniface became the Vatican's 193rd Pope. The details of his rule are controversial at best. This is because Pope Boniface got into a feud with King Philip of Spain, causing negative rumors to circulate about the Pope. It's difficult to say for certain which rumors were true and which were false. Boniface supposedly imprisoned the Pope before him for ten months until Celestine keeled over and died. He also allegedly had incestuous relations with his own children. He was repeatedly adulterous and even had an issue with young boys. After he became Pope, he built statues of himself all over Rome and began taking bribes for seats in the church. He was so evil that when Dante Alighieri wrote the Divine Comedy, he reserved a special place for Boniface in the Eighth Circle of Hell, the Salem Witch Trial. Trials. The Salem Witch Trials took place in Massachusetts and began in the early part of 1692. To this day, it's one of the most shocking examples of religious paranoia and fanaticism in American history. At least 200 people were accused of practicing the devil's magic, and 20 of them went on to be horrifically executed. Less than two decades later, in 1711, authorities pardoned many of the accused and gave them compensation. But it wasn't until July of 2022 that the last convicted Salem witch, Elizabeth Johnson, was finally exonerated. The trouble in Salem was directly caused by the witch fever that swept through Europe at the end of the 1600s. When the Europeans finally stopped burning their witches, Salem decided to pick up the torch. In 1689, England went to war with France in the American colonies, causing a surge of colonists to show up in Salem Village. There were too many people living in a small and cramped village, and those already in Salem were angry at the newcomers. This led to major tension between the original inhabitants of the village and the new arrivals. In 1692, when the daughter of Reverend Samuel Paris began to have strange fits, he blamed witches. Another girl named Anne Putnam Jr. also started convulsing 
nothing, and she too was accused of witchcraft. However, the witch hunts in Salem began due to the lingering paranoia that started in Europe. It's also believed that since there were so many migrants living in such a small village, the locals began to lose their minds. John Wycliffe John Wycliffe was an English priest who was largely responsible for the build-up of the Protestant Reformation that would sweep across Europe. He grew up in the mid-1300s, at a time when the Holy Roman Catholic Church reigned supreme. They had already split into the Western Catholic Church and Eastern Orthodox Church, but this only seemed to double their power. As an educated theologian and priest, John was vocal about the Church's abuses, and he challenged the hierarchy. He was even bold enough to say that the Scriptures were the supreme authority, not the Pope. He claimed the Church had strayed far from its original purpose and needed a desperate correction. The church didn't like people saying this stuff, especially those who were getting the attention of the masses. After he died of a stroke in 1384, John was brutalized by the church, and they condemned him as a heretic in 1415. His remains were later dug up and buried. Then his ashes were thrown into the river by angry Catholics. The Lion Fortress Hidden deep in the jungle of Sri Lanka is a gigantic stone column emerging from the thick canopy. The rock rises an incredible 660 feet, 201 meters, and was once the seat of power for a rogue king. The rock itself is called Sigiriya, and it holds a special place in the cultural history of the Sri Lankan people. The ancient stronghold built upon its back is mostly a ruin these days, but is still one of the most impressive ruins anywhere in Asia. And at the very bottom of the rock, guarding the steep staircase leading to the stronghold, is the lion, or what's left of it. Today, nothing but the lion's feet remain, the rest of what was once an imposing statue of a roaring lion long gone. The history of Sigiriya goes back to the year 476. The illegitimate son of a king, Kashyapa, took the throne by overthrowing the army, killing his father, and sending his brother fleeing in fear. The tyrant then crowned himself king in 477 and relocated the royal seat to Sigiriya. Kashyapa moved outside the traditional capital of Amaradapura because he was scared his brother, the rightful king, would return and take the throne by force. Sigiriya was chosen as the location for the new palace because it seemed like the perfect strategic base. If anyone tried to come and take the throne from him, they would have to climb the sheer face of the rock just to reach him. Unfortunately for the self-proclaimed king, that was exactly what happened. After building a majestic palace in one of the most picturesque locations possible, the rightful heir to the throne showed up and took his power back, and Sigiriya was left abandoned. The Ghost City of Ani There is a mysterious abandoned city in Turkey full of ghosts and shadows of history. It's called Ani, and it was once a great city with over a hundred thousand residents. Ani, also called the city of a thousand and one churches, was founded 1600 years ago, reaching its peak in the 11th century. But its original location on the crossroads of multiple trading routes would lead to its decline. First, the town grew rich from trade, but then it found itself right in the center of numerous battles. The region was captured almost too many times to count, it was taken by the Byzantines, the Ottoman Turks, the Armenians, Georgians, Russians, and Kurds. By the 1300s, the area had seen so much war that the previously wealthy trade city was in serious decline. It hardly made it through the Middle Ages, then was totally abandoned in the 1700s. There was a brief renaissance when the city was rediscovered in the 19th century, but its brief time in the spotlight came to an end when World War I started. Then things got worse when the Armenian Genocide took place. The Middle Ages broke Ani first, then the brutal wars of the 21st century left Ani and the whole area a desolate, destroyed, forbidden, no man's land. Pentadatilo Pentadatilo in Italy is an ancient town in the mountains of Calabria. The few remaining homes of the ghost town still cling to the craggy rock formations rising from the top of the mountain. The whole place has been empty since the 1960s, abandoned after being occupied since the 7th century BC. Researchers say the ancient Greeks settled the area first, naming the town Penta de Tilo or Five Fingers because of its finger-like rock formations. 
Ancient people visiting the area would have seen the city high up on the mountain, cradled underneath the tall figures as if resting in the palm of a great rocky hand. Edward Lear, a British artist, said it the best when he described the town in 1847 as perfectly magical. The town isn't all magical, though. During Easter of the year 1686, a massacre took place. Baron Bernardino Abenavoli was set to marry Antoinetta Alberti, but just before they were supposed to be married, Antoinetta's hand was given to another man instead. The Baron was so furious that on Easter night he sent a group of armed men into the castle of the local Marquis and massacred everyone. They killed every last member of the Alberti family present, sparing only the woman he originally wanted to marry. A few days later, they were wed, although none of her family were in attendance, obviously. I wanted to say a big thank you to Trin6996 and Gordon McDonald for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos about mysterious ancient places. The Weinstefan Brewery Weinstefan Abbey got its start around the year 1040 as a Benedictine monastery in what is today Bavaria, Germany. Inside the monastery was a brewery which supplied delicious beer for all the locals who could afford it. Historians believe the Weinstefan Brewery, still active today, is the oldest continuously operating brewery in history. If true, nobody else in the world has been making beer for as long as these guys, and it's all thanks to some monks. The original monastery was founded by St. Corbinian around 720 AD. He founded a church, built a dormitory for some monks, and with time it became a large religious center. More monks kept on coming, and in 1020 it was officially deemed a Benedictine abbey. The abbey would later be dissolved in 1803 following the reconstruction of Germany. Much of Bavaria was in ruins or economically destroyed, and in 1810 the abbey church was demolished. But don't worry, the brewery never stopped brewing beer. Even while Bavaria was in shambles, the brewery continued operations. It has been an officially licensed brewery now for almost a thousand years. The Temple of Amada The Temple of Amada is by far the oldest of the Lake Nasser temples built during ancient Egypt's 18th dynasty, 1550 to 1292 BC. It was Pharaoh Tutmosis III and his son Amenhotep II who ordered the construction of the majestic temple. Extremely important historical inscriptions can be found on its walls. These are inscriptions that give us a glimpse into the ancient past of Egyptian war and politics. Carved inside the sanctuary are images showing an Egyptian military campaign fought in Asia. It shows Amenhotep II bringing the bodies of dead rebel chieftains back to Thebes and hanging their corpses on walls. Then he sailed his ship through Nubia with the bodies of the dead tied to it, a grim warning to the Nubians not to mess with Egypt. Another carving near the entrance of the temple tells a different story. This one describes a Libyan invasion of Egypt during the rule of Menepta, Ramesses II's son. This carving was added during the 19th dynasty, likely under the orders of Ramesses himself to glorify his son and Egypt's victory over the desert dwellers to the west. The temple has sustained a serious amount of damage over the years. When Christians began to proliferate Egypt, they turned the heathen temple into a church. But damage was already done thousands of years earlier when the heretic king Tutmosis IV, also known as Akhenaten, defaced the figures inside. He chipped away representations of the god Amun-Re during his bizarre attempt to rid Egypt of the old gods the city of gladiators. In the ancient world of the Romans, the popularity of gladiators is a hard thing to quantify. You couldn't exactly go home and flick through the sports channels to see what you wanted to watch. There was one sport, and you had to go to the auditorium to see it performed. Gladiators were big business, especially in the city of Carnuntum. Some historians have called Carnuntum the lost city of the gladiators because it was the hub of ancient blood sport. The city of Carnuntum thrived along the Danube River in what is today Austria. It had about 60,000 civilians at its peak, plus a lot of military personnel. It functioned as a major military base for the Romans and housed two huge gladiator arenas and multiple gladiatorial facilities. The Romans called these facilities ludi, or gladiator schools. Slaves were sent to these schools to learn how to fight so that they could perform locally and potentially even shed blood in the Colosseum in Rome. 
This truly was a city of gladiators. Poor men came here from all over the Roman Empire with dreams of making a fortune in the arena. Fighting as a gladiator was not only for slaves or prisoners, but for anyone who had a thirst for blood and coin. Historians have even suggested the military made use of the large number of gladiators when they needed extra soldiers. During Carnuntum's height, it straddled the border of the empire. Beyond the Danube River were the savage tribes of barbarians. Having an enormous military base and multiple gladiator schools likely made the ordinary folk living here feel a lot safer. Kolomoki Mounds The Kolomoki Mounds belong to one of the largest woodland Native American sites in the southeastern United States. From between 350 and 750 AD, an early group of indigenous people called this place home. They built massive earthwork mounds that still stand to this very day. They're the biggest in the state of Georgia, located not far from the Chattahoochee River. As of right now, seven of the mounds are protected inside the state historic park. In the beginning years of what scientists now call the Common Era, Kolomoki was a hub of activity and the center of one of the largest population groups in North America. But just like so many mysterious sites whose builders have vanished, Nobody's entirely sure why the people here built so many mounds. Researchers say they were likely built according to the stars as some form of astrology. We know several of the mounds here form a central axis and align with the sun at the spring equinox. Other mounds align with the sun during the summer solstice. It clearly seems to be some kind of calendar, and yet there must be more to it than that. Temple Mound is by far the most impressive, standing 56 feet 17 meters tall and stretching 325 feet 99 meters at its longest. Researchers have estimated it took over 2 million baskets of raw earth to build, something that would have taken years. The gigantic mound was likely used as a kind of open-air temple, perhaps where people gathered to listen to religious leaders or participate in cult activity. Researchers say it also may have been a place for ceremonies and community games. Secrets of China's Great Wall There is almost nothing of the original Great Wall of China still standing. The truth is that the Great Wall was one big building project that lasted for over 2,300 years. This wasn't just a one-and-done building project. It was built in sections, repaired and restored by nine different Chinese dynasties. Building and maintenance continued for over 23 centuries, and so nearly nothing of the original structure can be seen today. Almost every single piece has been fixed or replaced at some point in the ancient past. Researchers from the Max Planck Institute for Geoanthropology recently investigated the Great Wall to learn more about its history. They wanted to see when certain segments were built and determine just how old the oldest parts of the wall are. Archaeologist Dr. Robert Patellano led the team, analyzing plant material used in the construction of beacon towers. His study revealed evidence that the oldest parts of the wall date back to about 221 BC, during the Warring States period. These sections were built from extremely primitive local materials. Things like reeds and bundles of wood were mixed with gravel and dirt. Basically, the earliest parts of the Great Wall were made from grass and mud. Vento Ice Norum Vento Ice Norum is one of three major Roman towns in Britain that isn't currently buried underneath the cobblestones of the Middle Ages. The Romans called it the Market of the Iceni because of its association with the Iceni Revolt. Around the year 60 AD, Queen Boudicca rose up against the Roman occupiers and started a rebellion. She and other furious Britons rampaged through the south, burned towns to the ground, destroyed London, and were eventually defeated by the Roman army. The town of Ventais Norum got its start in the years after the revolt, growing from a small Roman army base to a merchant village. This was fairly common after the Romans invaded Britain 2,000 years ago. Small bases grew into towns and prospered, but most of the time, these towns were paved over by newer, more modern cities. Ventais Norum, by some miracle, was left completely alone. It still stands 3.5 miles, 5.6 kilometers from Norwich, and is open to visitors. But it hasn't fared well over the years. Most of the city's buildings and fortifications have been swallowed by nature or destroyed. Hajar Im The megalithic temples in Malta date back to around 3600 BC, almost 6,000 years ago. 
Aja'im is by far one of the most spectacular of Malta's temples, perched on the edge of a cliff and surrounded by mysterious prehistoric structures. According to UNESCO, the temple is one of the oldest in the world. The big stone on the right side of its entrance is a whopping 20 tons and was put there by Stone Age people who paddled across the sea. Researchers believe the builders of what is essentially a giant religious site came from southern Italy, although there's no way of knowing for sure. The megalithic temples here, including Haja Im, are older than most famous archaeological sites. They're older than the pyramids of Giza and Stonehenge, so that's definitely something to think about. When Gordon Child, the director of the Institute of Archaeology at the University of London, visited Haja Im, it blew his mind. He said that even after seeing the ruins of Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Greece, he had never seen anything so old as the temples of Malta. And yet we still don't know everything about Haja Im and the other temples. They were obviously used for religious purposes, but what kind of religion was practiced here? Archaeologists have found evidence of animal sacrifices. They believe oracles operated here as fortune tellers. There are even suggestions of early astronomy. But what happened here 5600 years ago will likely always remain a mystery. The Legend of Gonzalo Guerrero Spanish conquistador Gonzalo Guerrero left Spain in the year 1511 to go to the New World. He wound up in Panama, then was shipwrecked on his way to Santo Domingo. The crew survived, was set adrift, and wound up coming ashore on the Caribbean coast of Mexico, in what is now the state of Quintana Roo. When they were apprehended by the locals, just about every single crew member was either killed or enslaved. Eight years later, in 1519, Hernán Cortés began his famous conquest of Mexico. At that time, there were only two survivors from Guerrero's shipwreck. There was Geronimo de Aguilar, who became an interpreter between Cortés and the Maya, and Gonzalo Guerrero. Guerrero took a slightly different path than most of the Spaniards. After he served as a slave, he managed to gain the trust of Maya leader Nachan Khan. He built himself up to the title of captain of an army of Maya soldiers, married a Maya woman named Zazil Ha, and had three children with her. These three kids became some of the very first children born of the Spanish conquest. Within about a decade, Guerrero had almost fully integrated into Maya society. According to chronicler Bernal Diaz del Castillo, Cortes tried to persuade Guerrero to join his cause and fight against the Maya. But Guerrero, who had tattooed his face, pierced his ears, and had basically become Maya, changed sides. He ended up fighting great battles against his countrymen, labeled a traitor by Spain, and ultimately falling in battle. While his switch to the other side didn't change history, it most certainly could have if more Spaniards had thought more about the natives than about killing them and stealing their gold. Hitler Assassination One of the biggest what-ifs these days involves Adolf Hitler and World War II. What if the plot to assassinate Hitler on July 20, 1944 was a success? How could this have changed history, and how many lives could have been spared? The plot involved high-ranking German military officers and a bomb in a suitcase. It also involved something called Operation Valkyrie, which was to trigger upon Hitler's death. The assassination was attempted by Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg. He belonged to a secret group of Germans who had enough of the war and wanted to change Germany's leadership before the whole country was in ruins. He agreed to put a bomb in a suitcase, attend a meeting at Hitler's headquarters, and blow everyone in the room up. Everything went wrong, just as the other half a dozen assassination attempts on Hitler had also gone wrong. The colonel stepped out of the room after he placed a bomb underneath the table, where the Führer and the other top officials were holding their meeting. Somebody noticed the suitcase and moved it away from the people. When it exploded, it was nowhere near Hitler, and he wasn't even injured. Nevertheless, Stauffenberg heard the explosion go off and assumed Hitler was dead. Without even checking, he rushed back to Berlin and activated Operation Valkyrie. This involved arresting the Gestapo and the men of the SS and putting new men in charge of the military and the government. Just as the operation started, news came that Hitler was alive and the colonel was found out. 
Many of the conspirators ate poison capsules and died before they could ever be apprehended, while an estimated 200 people involved in the conspiracy were hunted down and executed. The Teutoburg Forest Disaster The Roman disaster at Teutoburg Forest was one of their most humiliating defeats and a major turning point in history. It happened in the year 9, in the modern area of Kalkrisa in Germany. An alliance of Germanic people known to the Romans as barbarians ambushed several Roman legions and auxiliaries in the dark woods and slaughtered them. It was a major incident because the Romans had been expanding their territory into the northern lands. Their massive defeat here brought the Roman period of expansion to a grinding halt. In the years following, Rome never pursued the area of Germania again, and the barbarian hordes accumulated strength until they eventually took down the Roman Empire. There are some historians who say the defeat didn't actually change history. They say even if the Romans had conquered Germania, they would have never been able to hold it. However, if the Romans had never been ambushed, history still could have turned out much differently. We don't know if they would have held the region because they were never given a chance. In reality, they could have seized Germania, then spread themselves into what is now Poland, up into Scandinavia, and even into Russia. Maybe the Roman Empire never would have collapsed, and they really would have conquered all of the known world. Robert Peary and the North Pole On April 6, 1909, an American adventurer and explorer by the name of Robert Peary did something incredible. He and his assistant, Matthew Henson, along with four helpful Inuit locals, came across what Robert thought was the North Pole. This made him the very first man in the world to reach the elusive top of the world, the very place where Santa supposedly has his workshop. It was a major achievement in history, and one that Robert enjoyed for the rest of his days. He was wrong. Many years after Robert was dead, errors in his travel log surfaced and showed that he was actually several miles short of the North Pole. He thought he was the first one there, but he was actually only the first man a few miles from there. He almost changed history, but quite literally came up short. What you won't believe is that Robert Peary and Matthew Henson failed to reach the North Pole by a humiliating 30 miles, 48 kilometers. This was even more devastating, seeing as Matthew Henson would have not only been among the first men to reach the North Pole, but the first African American to reach the North Pole. It wouldn't be until 1952, on May 3rd, that Lieutenant Colonel Joseph O. Fletcher from Oklahoma stood on the exact location of the North Pole and actually changed history, abandoning Jamestown. The Jamestown colony was officially formed on May 14, 1607. About a hundred people from a venture called the Virginia Company founded the settlement, which was the very first permanent English colony ever erected on North American land. It was an exciting time in history and also a pretty gruesome one. The hundred settlers ran into issues immediately. Jamestown was almost a massive failure before the second wave of settlers showed up in 1610. They were stricken by famine, ravaged by unfamiliar diseases, and stuck in violent conflict with the Native American tribes who found them on their land. A shaky peace came following John Rolfe's marriage to Pocahontas, the daughter of a great Algonquin chief. The people of Jamestown began cultivating tobacco, expanded the area, and it remained the capital of the Virginia colony until 1699. It was the most important city to the English and was the very start of the United States of America. It was almost a total disaster. What a lot of people don't know is that back when the first settlers arrived, they almost gave up. Between 1607 and 1610, life was miserable for the settlers. They were weakened by starvation, they ate the leather of their shoes, consumed their own horses, and just about abandoned Jamestown altogether. Archaeologists even uncovered potential evidence of cannibalism. In the end, they held on until reinforcements came in 1610, and things started to slowly get better. Had they actually abandoned Jamestown, it's really hard to say just how different the history of North America may have turned out. The Black Death The Black Death was one of the biggest events in human history, and it almost altered the course of human civilization as we know it. The plague swept across Europe in the 14th century. Estimates vary, 
but historians generally agree about 50% of the population in many major cities was eradicated, and upwards of one-third of the entire European populace. The plague just about killed everyone in Europe, and even spread into Asia and North Africa. Against the odds, human beings survived. The horrifying plague bacterium Yersinia pestis killed a lot, but not all. It was really more of a hiccup in history, not altering so much as hindering European humanity. What's interesting to think about is that if the plague had been even just a little bit deadlier and had actually managed to kill another third of the population, history would have been majorly altered. The African kingdoms would have probably migrated north, the Asian kingdoms would have migrated west, and Europe today would be a vastly different place. The Blood Fluke In 1949, a worm prevented what would have been a brutal and bloody invasion of Taiwan, thereby altering the course of history. Or to think of it in another way, the worm prevented the course of history from being changed at all. However you want to look at it, the blood fluke Schistosoma japonicum played a major role at the end of the Chinese Civil War. The war had been ongoing for two decades. It paused briefly during World War II and then picked right back up. There were battles, truces, and violence from both sides. The conflict was fought between the Chinese nationalists led by the general Chiang Kai-shek and the communists led by Mao Zedong. The communists, near the end of the two decades of fighting, began to control most parts of China. It appeared the nationalists had no choice but to retreat, and so they ran to the island of Taiwan. In 1949, the communists were going to invade the island and put an end to the nationalists forever. This proved to be a really bad idea. There was nowhere for a whole army to even set foot on the island, and so the army started training their soldiers how to swim. They were going to drop the soldiers in the ocean and let them paddle to shore with all their equipment. Swimming lessons began in irrigation canals, which happened to be full of worms and parasites. They're called blood flukes, and about 10 million people were infected by them. The army got so sick that the invasion never happened, and Taiwan is still alive and well to this very day. William Walker's Mutiny Sergeant William Walker tried his best to change history, and failed. In November of 1863, Walker organized a mutiny and protest in response to the Union Army paying soldiers of color only a sliver of what was paid to white soldiers. Walker was an officer in the 3rd South Carolina Volunteers, and he convinced his soldiers to put their guns down and not fight until they were given equal pay. They were only making about $7 a month to fight in the Civil War. The protest was short-lived, and Walker was convicted of mutiny on January 9, 1864. He was executed, and so were 19 other soldiers throughout the Civil War, who also led similar mutinies. These 20 mutineers may not have changed the tide of the war, but they almost came close. If more officers had been of a similar mind, thousands of more troops may have put their weapons down, and the South may have come out on top. Failed Assassination of Vladimir Lenin On August 30, 1918, Soviet leader Vladimir Lenin was shot twice after he spoke at a factory in Moscow. He was nearly assassinated by a member of the Social Revolutionary Party named Fania Kaplan. Lenin was wounded but lived to terrorize Russia another day, and history was only slightly changed. In the aftermath of the assassination attempt, Lenin majorly cracked down on the social revolutionaries and any other political party that thought they could oppose him. Thousands of people were executed, and Russia was plunged deeper into civil war. But what may have happened if one of the worst dictators Russia ever saw was killed that day? It's really difficult to say, but history definitely would have taken a major turn. Lenin turned himself into the dictator of the very first Marxist state the world ever saw, and even though his government made peace with Germany, that peace didn't last very long. And besides, Lenin was the creator of the USSR, which stands for the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. After he died in 1924, Joseph Stalin took his place. Joseph Stalin was the Russian version of Hitler, the creator of the Gulag, and the direct cause for the Great Famine that killed about 14.5 million people between 1932 and 1933. 
The reason Joseph Stalin is important to consider is because without Lenin, who, by the way, was responsible for an estimated 9 million deaths during his Marxist revolution, Joseph Stalin would never have come to power. It all could have been changed with a pair of bullets, if only they'd struck a few inches over. The failure of Napoleon. Russia was almost conquered by the French in 1812. It was almost a major turning point in history and would have had major implications for everything that happened after, including probably stopping World War I and World War II before they ever began. Alas, the word almost is very important here, because on June 24, 1812, Napoleon Bonaparte crossed the Niemen River with the Grande Armée and made an epic fail. It was one of the biggest disasters the French ever saw. Napoleon had assumed the Russian army would fight his 500,000 troops. Instead, they teased the French and retreated deeper into the Russian winter. The French were not prepared for the cold, the roads were too poor to properly transport supplies, and about 300,000 French soldiers died. Yes, Russia lost about 200,000, 70,000 of those at the Battle of Borodino, but Napoleon was the big loser in this battle. The invasion went so poorly for Napoleon that after he sabotaged his entire army, he was banished to the Mediterranean island of Elba. What's your favorite alternate timeline of history? Let me know in the comments, and thanks for watching. Be sure to hit subscribe, and I'll see you again soon for another awesome video.